I want us to open our Bibles, please, to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Um, I was speaking to someone not too long ago, and a relatively new believer, and this person said, when I started to read my Bible, I started in the book of Revelation. My eyes got about that big, and he said, it was tough going. Yeah. So for anyone who is... A, relatively new believer, and we've got some, I'd encourage you, uh, don't go there. Uh, <laughs> okay. Don't do that first off. There's lots of other stuff uh, that we can talk about and, and get you going in the direction of, okay? We're going to be having um, Russell come in just a couple minutes and read for us just the first few verses. We are going to try to take a look at the whole of the whole of chapter one. There is a lot there. We're going to try and pick out the things that are going to be sort of applicable to the things that we are doing. Uh, we do have some of the uh, sheets back there if you want to grab one of those. We do have some things for the children as well uh, to try and engage if you want to, if you want to. The book of Revelation, the book of Revelation. The word revelation actually means the unveiling or the revealing, the revealing. So the word itself is not too difficult to understand. However, it's all about revealing what God is going to do. God is going to do. That's the idea. Now, you know, it's funny how things come and go, how fads come and go. Isn't that interesting? Uh, something new that's happened, I've noticed, is that when, when a woman's getting ready to have a baby, now they've got this thing they call a gender reveal. You ever seen that before? Have you noticed that on social media or whatever? Gender reveal. So it's like a big to-do that they have this party, they gather together, and they do all sorts of things to reveal whether it's a boy or a girl. And so, uh, oddly enough, I, I was just traveling around and kind of came across this little photo right here as an example of one of these things. Now, if you study the photo uh, of the mom and the two sisters, uh, because it's blue smoke, that means it's going to be a boy. Can you guess which sister is happy it's going to be a boy? Yeah? Can you guess which sister is devastated that it's going to be a boy? Yeah, there we go. That's not too hard to figure out. Not too hard to figure out. And so the things that are revealed are, 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 are things that we're going to be looking at, not in particularly what we're going to be looking at for the next several weeks. That's into the book of Revelation. But we want to take a look at the first couple of chapters over the next several weeks about the various churches because I'm so thankful for what all that God is doing within RCBC. Isn't it exciting? It is exciting. But we have to be also aware that along with that is a massive opportunity for Satan, the enemy of all that God wants to do to cause disruption, problems. Because the reality is, anytime you gather new people, that means different personalities, right? Different backgrounds different church experiences, and it's tough enough when you get married, right? Two people come together, different, what? Backgrounds, different experiences, different expectations within a marriage, right? Okay, and there's enough new people here. Now, if you've heard this story before, close your ears and go to sleep for, for a minute or two. This is my favorite go-to story when it comes to this. When Lisa and I first got married, um, it wasn't, yes, hold on now, so close your ears on this. We first got married, we were there and we were doing some laundry. I thought, you know, helpful, do the laundry. Here we were, clothes are dry, we were, we were folding these towels. And uh, we got to these towels, and I was folding this towel, and she looked at me. And you know what I did? Back out. And she said, Eric. That's not how you fold a towel. I said, so I fold a towel. And thus it began. All kinds of things. All kinds of things. 
So as a church, we have to be very careful. So we're going to be looking at these churches that are described there in the early chapters of the book of Revelation. And we're going to try to unfold this and open this up for us as an introduction today and looking over the next several weeks at the various churches. Because we want a church that honors the Lord. Is that not true? We want a church that honors God. We want a church that is as biblically correct as we can be. Is that what we want? That is what we want. That's what we want. Okay. Now, I will say that there are some difficulties in Revelation because there are many word pictures, there's images, there's things that you say, what, is that, what does that really mean? And that's why there's so much controversy, controversy about what Revelation means, what's going to be happening, all these kind of things. Now, my own personal take is that, you know, I've got my own thoughts, but at the end of the day, God is not going to ask my opinion, okay? God's going to do what God's going to do, and that's okay with me. That's okay with me. However, when it comes to this thing of trying to understand pictures and understand images, you know, there's this whole new thing in what's called modern art. And I've got a couple of these little examples. Here. Oh, no, there's another little picture. Oh, another one of the reveal thing. Can you see this little, uh, this little sign here that says, uh, the dog is saying, our parents are giving us a little man. We were hoping for a puppy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the dogs are a little bit disappointed. But going on to the scene of modern art. So, so this is a very famous picture, okay, very famous uh, uh, painting. It's called The Persistence of Memory. Now, how do you interpret that? What does that mean? I bet you, if you could go around the room, you were to ask each person, what does that mean? You get, for 40 people, you get 40 different answers. And this is part of the problem. Part of, there are many, just like this is an image, it's a picture, but there's many pictures in Revelation to try to understand exactly what God is saying. Now, one more, now believe it or not, this is a real thing. This is called white on white. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah, you see that right here? There's a, there's a piece of something right there on the something. I would reckon that's worth 100,000. Can you believe it? I mean, I think I did that on my wallpaper one time. I got the wallpaper wrong. Yeah. I, I should have sold it for a million pounds. It would have been great. This is some of the challenges. This is some of the challenges. So, so I'm going to ask if Russell could come up. He's going to read for us Revelation chapter 1, <coughs> verses 1 through 3. And because we are growing and we have sort of people all the way to the back, I'm going to ask if you'd be happy as you come up. I know I threw it on Russell in the beginning, but if you wouldn't mind, just feel okay to use the microphone. Don't, don't, don't feel intimidated. So Russell's got a big booming voice anyway. So uh, <laughs> it's be okay just right there. Okay? Here we go. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of St. John the Divine. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, and show unto his servants things which will shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that you saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Thank you very much, Russell. Thank you very much. And that is the word of the Lord. If you have the papers, uh, there will be some words that will come up here, and those will be the words that you can fill in on those papers if it's helpful. If it's not helpful, then, then don't worry about it. We just uh, want to try and give you an opportunity to engage a little bit more. Um, we're going to call this today, we're going to call this a letter from home. A letter from home. Eric, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is for the Christian, for the believer, is this earth that we are sat on today, is this our true home? It's not. Actually, the Bible calls the calls believers that we are ambassador. An ambassador means that we are a representative from another country that goes into a foreign country. So to kind of extend that out, that means that our true home is where? In heaven. And that we are here on earth as representatives of God. So we have here a letter from John. But we're going to look at this and think about it being a letter from home. 
Now, letters uh, back in the, in, the, in the New Testament times were different than we would write, right? Do you remember in the day, if you were away and, you know, back before email and social media and all that stuff, you'd get out a piece of paper. Remember that piece of paper? Remember that stuff? And maybe a pencil or a pen. And what would you do? Dear mom, right? Blah, 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 blah. Love, Eric, or what, or sincerely, it doesn't depend on who you're right. Remember all that? You, you remember what I'm talking about. Yes. Young people have no idea, but yes, uh, us older ones, we, we get it. We, we remember that. The letters in the New Testament in the Bible are different. They're structured differently. So this may confuse us a little bit. I don't want to be confusing. We want to take a look at this and try to understand what is happening. So first of all, we're going to look at this thing we just called Dear Mom. Dear mom, dear mom, the structure is different. But we have what I'm going to call sort of a communication chain. A communication chain, that which Russell just got done reading. Notice what it says. Notice what it says. In the first few verses, let me read that again. The revelation or the revealing, the displaying of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Okay, so who is the giver? God was the giver who was the him to Jesus. That's interesting. God came to Jesus to show his servants. Who is the servants? Okay, we're going to find out. To give him servants, which should surely, uh, which must surely take place. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, who? John. So we see the chain here. God gave it to who? Jesus. Who gave it to? The angel. Who gave it to? John. That's a lot of bits on the chain. Right? That's a lot of bits. Now, you may say straight away, now wait a minute, Eric. Go and say that. Now, wait, wait, a wait a minute, Eric. You would say maybe that I thought Jesus is God. And that's true. Jesus is God. However, we see in the Bible that Jesus submits himself to the Father. And I don't understand how it works. I don't understand how it works. But it's amazing. It's amazing. That here we have these incredible mysteries within the scripture. But as we have this chain here of the Father revealing this to Jesus, who revealed it to his angel, who then revealed it to John, the servant. He said, the things which will happen soon, the things which must shortly take place, now, there's lots of argument about this as well. Okay? Ready for this? Some, some say, okay, does that mean that this is going to happen within John's lifetime? These things that are written in Revelation, all these various things. Okay? Probably not. I think what he's dealing with is more, this is the next thing on God's timetable. This is the next big chunk of stuff that's going to happen. Because the first thing was the coming of the... Messiah, Christ was going to come. He was going to die. He was going to raise again. The church was going to happen. But then the next big thing is all the stuff that God is going to be talking about in the book of Revelation. There's lots of possible discussion, and that's okay. But that's not our purposes for today. Delivered by an angel. And by the way, the, angel, the word angel means messenger. Simple as that. And that is one of the main functions of an angel is to be that of a messenger. I hate to pop any bubbles, but the main job of angels is not to float around on clouds and play harps. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry if that destroyed anyone's vision of what an angel was, but that's not the purpose of an angel. Also, also um, when people die, they don't become angels. That's also a bit of a myth. Okay? That's not true. Not true. Angels are messengers. That is the main function, amongst other things. Amongst other things. So, the Bible says, as it continues on in Revelation, an incredible thing. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Wow. Okay. 
says two things about that. It says, first of all, blessed are you who hear, but not only just hear, but keep the things. That you do the things. Okay? And in the Bible, hearing and doing are very much connected together. James talks about that. He's saying, James, matter of fact, there's a lot of debate on whether James should even be in the Bible because it seems to talk a lot about doing. But I'd argue very strongly that, that James should be in the Bible because hearing and doing are connected together. Yes, people can choose not to do, but for believers, Christians who are listening to God, it should be natural for us to not just hear, but to do, to obey. Okay, do we all agree on that? Is that okay? Good. On the same page, on the same page. But then we have this incredible greeting, this incredible greeting, verses 4 through 7. Notice what it says. Here we go. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Let me go ahead and read these few verses. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, and again, amen. amen. So here's the greeting. Here's the greeting. Okay, going back now. Remember we said in our letter that we're used to, dear mom. So what's traditional here, they would say something like this. What John says, John. Instead of waiting at the end, they would say, or Paul to the church at Galatia. Paul to the church at Philippi. That's their pattern. John does the same thing. He says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So the from is where? John to who? The seven churches. These seven churches are what we're going to be looking at for the next several weeks. <clears throat> Now the question is, and it's a good question, well, Eric, does that mean that there are only seven churches in all of Asia? And the answer is no. Well, if the answer is no, then why the seven churches? Well, as we remember, in Revelation, there's lots of pictures and images, and the word, and the, and the number seven is, a, is, a, is an important number. If you look throughout the Bible, the seven normally shows the idea of completeness or fullness. Okay. Uh, seven days of creation. On the seventh day, God did what? God rested. Okay. If you look at the number seven all throughout, it seems to be a pattern of completeness. And here, so quite possibly, these seven churches who were real churches, okay, that God chose this to be able to have send the message of completeness or fullness. But we aren't really told exactly why. That's just a guess. But here's an interesting greeting. And this is a common greeting. John to the seven churches in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him. Let's just think about just a moment now. The thing of grace and peace. What is grace? What is, one of my things is I don't like using words that we don't know what they mean. Right? We use churchy words. Don't we use churchy words? We throw them about. But if we don't know what they mean, that bothers me. That bothers me. What does grace mean? Okay, for anyone who's been, uh, and I think Russell, we've been through Russell a few times now. Grace means what? Grace, grace means that God gives me something that I don't, oh, very good. Dorian remembers that. That I don't deserve. When Jesus died on the cross, he offers us what? Forgiveness. Do we deserve forgiveness? And we answer that with a great big no. But out of God's grace, He offers it to us, He gives us, even though we do not deserve it. Out of God's grace. 
And for that we can say, praise the Lord. Amen. <coughs> what would we do without God's grace? But not only that, he says, grace to you and peace. Peace. What is peace? What is peace? Is peace a lack of trouble? Is peace a lack of trouble? You may say, well, of course it is, Eric. Well, it could be. It could be. However, I'd like to put it to you that our friend Paul, who wrote in the book of Philippians, the theme of Philippians is what? Peace. And where is Paul writing from? He was writing from prison. Now, we're not talking about the Hilton prisons that we have often today. We're talking about the first century prisons of a uh, 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 of, of the Roman, of the Roman, what's what, Roman what? Roman Empire. Empire. The Roman Empire. Okay. It wouldn't have been nice. It wouldn't have been three squares. It wouldn't have been air con in the summer and heating in the winter. It wouldn't have been that. But how is Paul able to say peace in the midst of that? You know, this is the amazing thing. This is the amazing thing. God so much wants us to be able to experience after his grace that he gives us peace. And my definition of peace would be not the lack of trouble, but a confidence that God has everything under control. That God has your back. And so because of that, we can experience the peace of God. Remember, Philippians speaks about the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding. Isn't that amazing? So this is what John sends this greeting to these churches. Now notice what it says here. It says, and this, we can pick this part. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That's interesting. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and so forth and so on. So who are these? Who are these? What is this? What is this? Now I'm going to suggest something to you. You can argue with me afterwards when we have a cup of tea. That's okay. Lots of people do. Okay, it's all right. I'd like to suggest to you that within what John's writing, grace to you and peace from him. From him who is, who was, and who is to come. What does that sound like, by the way? Jesus. Sounds like Jesus. Sounds like Jesus. Could it be Jesus? From him, and from the seven spirits, and from Jesus Christ, in verse 5. Well, why would he say from Jesus, and again from Jesus? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Not really. Who could it be? Who? I think it could be Janus. I think it could be the Father. Because he who was and is and who is to come, that talks about that God is eternal, that God has always been. Yes, it speaks about like that with Jesus as well. But wait a minute, Jesus is God. It all connects. It all connects. So I think it's speaking about him who is and was and is to come. I think it's speaking about the Father, I think. How about this? And the seven spirits are that are before his throne. Who or what is that? Who or what is that? Seven spirits. Now, if it was one spirit, I could understand. Yeah, I could see that. But seven, why seven? Now, remember, saying that Revelation has lots of images, lots of pictures. I'd like to suggest that the number seven, because of the completion, because of the fullness, it's a way of speaking of the Holy Spirit. So I think John is saying, from the Father, from the Spirit, and guess what? Who's left? As it says in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. And from Jesus Christ. So I think that is what we are dealing with. John sends a greeting to these seven churches from the Father, the Spirit, and Christ. But then I want you to notice what happens. He comes into this next little section, these next couple of verses. And he gives us an incredible brief snapshot, a brief picture on who Jesus really is. Are you ready? Okay. 
We could spend months on this, but we don't have months. We have a few minutes. Let's take a look. Notice what it says. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. The faithful witness. That word is the same word that we get the word martyr from. Okay? What is a martyr, by the way? What's a martyr? Someone who dies for a cause, someone who dies for the faith. Did Jesus die for the faith? He did. He died for us. And he is a faithful martyr, a faithful witness, one who died for us. That's the first little description of who this is. But he didn't just stop there. Notice what he says. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. So there's the death, and now we have the Resurrection. This is pretty good. John knows what he's on about. Firstborn from the dead, the resurrection. But then he gets more intense. I love it. Isn't this great? Firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. The ruler over the kings of the earth. Well, wait a minute. I thought, I thought. We have the Prime Minister of England. We've got the President of here, the King of here. But wait a minute. Who is King over all? Jesus is. King Jesus. So, that is why I say, when you read the news, maybe yesterday, about Iran's, did you, did you see that? Yeah. Iran's a bombing and the, uh, the drones. <coughs> you know, don't, don't fear. Don't fear. The kings of the earth may play their, their chess game, but King Jesus has it all under control. Okay? Does he not? He does. He does. He is the ruler of the kings of all the earth. There is no king that is above him. And that we can be sure. And that's the reason why in all my, my, my times in, in talking with Liana in, in Ukraine and, and the various things, you know, my heart breaks for the things that I see. And Liana, I was just talking to her last week, and Ukraine is talking about an, an, uh, increasing the conscription. She just got married. She's just coming up to a year of, of her first anniversary, and she is so frightened. And then Vadim will be called into the military. And for anyone who remembers back in the day when you first got married, you have to think of your husband being sent off. And she said, Eric, it's so disturbing because every time I see in the news that in our town, in Rivne, there's one or two or five or ten funerals every day, it seems like. And it's such your pieces. It's your pieces. Now, I can't say that I truly understand because I've never been in that situation. But you know, we, but we can't wring our hands and say, oh no, what, what are we going to do? We have to pull back and say, you know what? As much as I don't understand what God is doing, we have to understand and know that Jesus is the king over all the kings of the earth. Okay? And if we will let that go from here down to here, we'll be far better off. Okay? He is the king over the kings. But notice what it says then. The king over the kings. To him who did what? Who loved us. It is good news that Jesus loves you and loves me. Even in all my failures, even in all my weaknesses, he loves you. Even the times that we mess up, he loves you. The times that we fail him, he loves you. The times that we forget about him, he loves you. Times that we beat ourselves up, right? Are you, have you ever beaten yourself up for something? Yeah. I'm pretty good at it, by the way. I could write a book about beating yourself up. Okay, Doreen knows that. Doreen knows that. I could write a book about it. And all my beatings up of Eric, I need to remember that Jesus loves me. There's a simple little song. Heather probably knows what I'm all about. And I remember way back in the day, song says this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, 
Yes, Jesus loves me. Why? The Bible tells us so. Just got done reading that. That he loves us. And that's some good, good news. But not only did he just say he loves us, he did something about it. The Bible says that he moves on and says that um, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. We just got done dealing with that over Good Friday, Easter, the death of Jesus. But you know what? When it says that he washed us, I, I like the, the actual word means that he loosened us from our sins. He loosened us from our sins. And what's the picture? The picture is that people are bound in chains by what? Sin. Jesus comes along, he died on the cross, he makes a way that if we would open up our heart to him, that he did what? He would take the key and unlock that lock, and he loosens us from our sins. What an amazing thing that Jesus has done for us. Washed us, loosened us from our sins. Verse 6, and made us kings and priests to his God and Father. Now, okay, sometimes translation can be difficult. I'm going to give you the actual <coughs> word that it says here. It says, and made us kings. I don't think personally that's the best translation. Because the word is kingdom. He made, but it doesn't work for English. Can't, we can't say he made us a kingdom. It doesn't make sense, does it? But here's what it means. He means that as we are living on this earth, that you are part, as a believer, you are involved in God's kingdom. I'm not a king. I, I'm never a king. I'll never be a king. Even if I, even, even if, let's see, let's see, Charles, then who's next? Is it William? Who's next? Who? George. And about five million people down, that's there. Okay? I'll never get there. I'll never get there. So we have one king. That is King Jesus. But I am part of Jesus' kingdom. That's some good news. That's some good news. So, as because of what Jesus did, he loosened us from our sins. We are involved in we are part of his kingdom. But not only that, it says that we are priests. We are priests to God, his Father. We are priests. Can you believe that? Eric, what does that mean? That means that if you are here as a Christian, you are a priest in your own right. Eric, what does that mean? That means that we can go directly to God. I don't have to go to a person to say, Heather, will you... Will you, will you speak to God for me and ask God to forgive me? I don't have to do that myself. myself. And that's what it meant. And that was the whole image. Do you remember that when, when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that this within the temple area, there was this place that was called the Holy of Holies, this very special place. And I apologize if you don't know what we're on about here, but hang, be patient. This very special place that, that the high priest in Israel could only go one time a year. Incredibly special, but there was a massive curtain in between. That place and the next place. But when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that that curtain tore in two. Opening the way for us to be able to approach God ourselves. So we can pray. We can approach God ourselves. But maybe the question is... Do we pray? <laughs> Do we take advantage of that? Or we just say, well, that's nice. That's nice. But I tell you what, what would, how would the Old Testament believers who could not pray and have the opportunity like we do, how would they look to us? They would say, Eric? I mean, we're not talking about 24 7. We're not talking about that. I'm saying, do we have a prayer life? That we communicate with God like they did not have the opportunity to. All those things. And notice what he says for that response. For that response. In verse 6. Made us kings and priests to his father, to, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. 
To him be the glory. What is glory? Another word, what does glory mean? What does glory mean? Another churchy word, what does it mean? What does glory mean? Glory means a high opinion of someone that results in some kind of praise, some kind of well done, something like that. That's what glory means. So when we understand all of these things, when we understand everything that Jesus did, when we understand that we are priests, then we understand that Jesus loosed us from our sins, what should the response be? The response should be glory to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. And if that is not our response, then maybe one, we are not a believer, or maybe two, our hearts are so far off the, so far off the track. We need to rethink about what this is all about. Because the Bible says then that he is coming again. And every eye will see him, even those who crucify him. Even those who crucify him. And then he finishes up that little section. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In the summary... I am the Alpha and Omega, verse 8, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, if you don't know those words, the Alpha and the Omega, what is that? Well, in the, in the, the Bible, which is written in the Greek language, Alpha is the first letter of the alphabet, and Omega is the last letter of the alphabet. So our, if, we were, if this was written in English, we would say, here it is. I am the A and the Z. Okay? So that means that Jesus is everything. He is everything. So we want to spend just another few minutes now, and we'll be finished, looking at this last section, verses 9 through 16. I want you to see now John's surprise. John's surprise. It says, I, John both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here's John's situation. Here's John's situation. He says, I'm a brother. I'm a brother. I'm just a normal book. I don't have any special qualifications. I don't have a doctor or anything like that. I'm just a brother. But the other thing is that it's amazing. So within God's family, if you're part of God's family, that means that, that myself and you, if you're a bloke, you're, that we're brothers. And if you're a girl or woman, that, you, that means that you're my sister. Isn't that pretty nice? Yeah. That's part of being a, what God's family, and that's what it looks like. That's what it means. And he says that as one who is a companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience and perseverance of Christ. I think what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to wind this up a bit early. I'm not going to be able to get through everything that I want to get through today. Because I don't want to leave this off and just kind of skirt over it. We'll be done. Notice what John says. He says this. He says, your brother and companion in tribulation... What does tribulation mean? It means trouble. It means difficulties. I am your companion in tribulation and troubles and kingdom and patience or perseverance in Jesus Christ. Now, let's think for just a moment. Let's think for just a moment. Why was John on this island? Why was he there? It says that he was there because of his testimony for Jesus Christ. That means that, that the authorities did not like what John was doing. John was preaching. But John was telling people about, about Jesus, who he was. They had taken John and put him on that island. Remember like, uh, was it Napoleon got put up on Elba or something like that? Yeah, I saw some uh, Anyway, the idea of, of exiling someone or back in the day, when people were sent to Australia as punishment, that's the same idea. John was put there as punishment. As punishment. Well, he says this. John, 
the one who is your companion, your brother, in the tribulation of Christ. You know, when it comes to troubles, when it comes to troubles and problems, and we all have it, this is one of the important things about what church is all about. As brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the functions, one of the reasons for church is to be able to lift up each other. And my big go-to is, is Romans 12, and it says, the Bible says that we should rejoice with those who rejoice, but also it says that we should do what? Weep with those who weep. And you know what? That's so important. And I don't want ever you, I don't want you to ever feel that you are out there on your own. And that's why church and being here and, and being with others is so, so important. Because when we go through stuff that life throws at us, we need each other. And I've told you this a million times, that, 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 that you need me and I need you. And we need each other. That's the picture of what church is, one of the things that church is. But then John adds this. He says, companion in the tribulation and kingdom. So John was even saying that as I am here on this island of Patmos as an exile, that I could still be part of God's kingdom and doing kingdom work. Was John doing kingdom work even though he was on the island of Patmos? Was he? Better believe it. What was he doing? What was he doing? He was there receiving the book of Revelation. Now hold on now. Hold on. So had John not had the tribulation, had John not had the problems that he had, had John not been put on the Isle of Patmos as an exile, we will not have the book of Revelation. And that's an amazing thought. So John said, one who is in sharing of the tribulation, one who is in kingdom living, and then last of all, and we're done for today, that of perseverance. Perseverance. I wish I could tell you that for everyone who is a Christian or maybe is brand new into all this or is maybe thinking about all this, I wish I could tell you that once you say yes to Jesus, then everything becomes wonderful. All life's problems go away. And all the, all the rough places in the road become smooth, right? And all the potholes go away. <laughs> Ain't true. Ain't true. So John says, John says, in the perseverance of Christ. But that's again why church is so important. That we come alongside each other, hook arms with the person who's next to you. And you say, you know what? We're going to get through this together. John, from God to Jesus, to the angel, to John, to these seven churches. And as we explore these seven churches, let's together look at what God is saying. That we can learn from their mistakes, avoid their mistakes, and do what they do. That is good, and that's right. That as we move forward as a church, that we can do everything and be everything. That's the goal.